search for life beyond Earth is one of the most exciting endeavors of contemporary astronomy. But if there is life elsewhere in the solar system, how might we find it? This episode, I've been speaking to Dr. Emily drabek Monder, who is part of a team of astronomers that have made an incredible discovery around our planetary neighbor, Venus. I'm Dr. Emily drabek Monder. Uh, I'm an astronomer at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Uh, I've worked in research for about the past 10 years, but most recently I'm now in public engagement and I'm the senior manager of public astronomy at the Royal Observatory. Great. Well, thanks very much for speaking to me today, Emily. And um, the reason that we're talking is because you've been part of a a really big discovery that's just been announced regarding really the the prospect of of life on Venus, the the prospect of life um, beyond Earth. Um, Could you tell us a bit about the discovery and, and, and how it came about? Yeah, so what we've done is found a rare gas in Venus's clouds that we call uh, phosphine. And this gas on a rocky planet like the Earth is uh, the direct result of life. Um, So it's what we call a biosignature. Now, on Earth, we find that phosphine gas is produced by human activity through industry um, and microorganisms or microbes. So finding a gas like this on Venus is incredibly exciting, and it could mean that um, it's also being produced by life in the clouds of Venus. Were you and the team actually looking for phosphine like, as, as, as a biomarker, or did you just happen to discover it? No, so we were definitely looking for phosphine when we first started um, searching with our telescopes. So this all kind of came about uh, because the leads uh, of the study, Jane Greaves, we were working together on trying to understand the possibility for life in our solar system. And we were specifically looking um, at the possibility for life in icy moons that we find in the solar system. So for example, Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa, they have these oceans below their icy surfaces. But one of the problems that we often ran into is that uh, when we were searching for gases that could be a clue for life in these environments, those gases can be made in really different ways. So they can be produced by natural chemistry, um, and they could also be produced by life, but there's many other paths to, to making them. And so Jane eventually came across phosphine gas. Um, and it was because she was looking at um, the study about penguin waste in Antarctic environments. And so literally penguins, um, their waste products have lots of phosphine in them. And there was a direct uh, uh, correlation between penguins and phosphine gas in the soils of, of these Antarctic environments. And so phosphine kind of seemed to be our answer to our previous issues. It's a gas that on the earth, it's produced by life, but it's actually very difficult to be produced um, in other ways. And so that's kind of how the idea came about that we would search for this gas in Venus's clouds. I think um, a, a lot of people, when they're thinking about the search for life um, beyond Earth, elsewhere in the solar system, especially around the icy moons, they'll, they'll sort of think of those uh, robotic probes um, and, and, and orbiters and, and rovers and things like that, like on Mars. Um, but all your observations were, were ground-based, weren't they? Absolutely, yes. So our first observation um, that that we managed to discover phosphine um, was taken by the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. And that's a, a large radio telescope um, in, in Hawaii. And then we were able to confirm that discovery of phosphine using um, an, an even bigger telescope, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA for short, which is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And yeah, both are, both are on the grounds and um, yeah, we managed to capture phosphine that way. Why did you decide to to look for life around Venus? Because it's a pretty inhospitable planet, isn't it? So you're right. Venus is an incredibly hostile place. Um, so on the surface of the planet, you know, we have very high temperatures, hotter than an oven, kind of four, over 450 degrees Celsius. And we also have very high pressures, so high enough to crush the human body, um, kind of 90 times that what we have here uh, on the surface of the Earth. Uh, but the clouds are a little bit more hospitable. They have lower temperatures, around 20 to 30 degrees. 
um, and kind of more reasonable pressures as well. So more similar to that of the Earth. Um, so there's been this theory kind of floating about um, for the past 60 years or so that even though the surface of the planet is incredibly hostile, uh, the clouds might be a little bit more hospitable. Um, so we just kind of wanted to test that theory out and see if there could be microbial life or microorganisms that could exist in those cloud environments. Is there anything that can be done to actually confirm this? Because at the moment, it, you, you, it, there's still quite a lot to do to actually be able to say whether or not there is, there is my microbial life on Venus, isn't there? Absolutely, yes. So there's many questions that we have to answer before we can conclude can conclude that there is life in Venus's clouds. Um, so really, if we if we want to confirm that, then we're going to need to send a spacecraft out to Venus to directly study the clouds um, and actually take samples of the clouds and things like that. Um, but you know, so far, what we have been able to do is rule out quite a lot of other scenarios for, you know, that from our understanding of Venus currently. So we've been able to um, rule out that this phosphine gas is caused by um, sunlight interacting with the atmosphere of Venus. We've been able to rule out um, that the phosphine gas is caused by volcanoes and even lightning on the planet. Um, so really, you know, it, yes, it's possible that this phosphine gas could be caused by life, but it also could be caused by some unknown geology or, or chemistry that's going on on the planet. So yeah, there's still many more questions to be answered. And in the end, we will need to send a spacecraft out to the planet. How do you actually go about ruling out those alternative methods for phosphine produ production? So in the short term, I think what we can do um, is kind of study how uh, phosphine changes over time, if it does change over time. Um, so we can do that with the ground telescopes that we have now. Um, and so just as Venus orbits the sun, we can just check to see if the amount of phosphine changes. And that could give us an indicator, um, you know, if there is a, a natural process that, that's behind uh, the production of phosphine gas. Um, and then in the end, like I mentioned before, you know, just sending a spacecraft out to Venus and, and um, taking samples of the atmosphere. I think we're really going to have to think about what we're searching for, though. The scientific community is going to have to come together that if we are searching for life, what kind of life would that be? What would we need to find um, to, to, uh, to indicate that there is life in the clouds and it's not just some sort of chemistry going on? Do you do you think that there's a sort of um, there's almost like an irony in considering how much energy and resources we've put into orbiters and landers and rovers on Mars, when in actual fact um, we we might we might we might eventually discover life beyond Earth on Venus on our on our kind of our, our other neighbor, but our neighbor that's that seems a lot more unlikely for life to life to exist. I mean, I, I it is a little bit ironic, but I mean to be completely honest, I think. The lesson that this would teach us if we do find life in the clouds of Venus is that life can exist in many different environments. And we already had that indication uh, on the Earth. So you see life in pretty extreme places on the Earth. And we call these forms of life extremophiles. So you can find life, you know, it, in places where we previously didn't realize life could even be. So at the bottoms, you know, of the oceans, near hydrothermal vents, in boiling conditions. We also find life in incredibly acidic conditions on the Earth. So, you know, just looking at, um, you know, runoff or drainage from, from mining, for example, we find life there. Um, so I think what the lesson that we might learn is that we need to look for life kind of everywhere in the solar system and not necessarily rule out a place just because it's, you know, it's that uh, seems hostile or inhospitable. Yeah, it is just interesting though, because um, especially because you were you were mentioning the um, search for life around the kind of icy those icy moons, like Enceladus in Europa, that have subsurface oceans, oceans beneath beneath their icy crust. Because because there's that whole thing of you you look for the water because we know that water is where you find life on Earth. It it just seems that like it it it, it might be kind of quite funny after all to you know that. You know that we don't find we don't find life in a nice in a nice kind of salty liquid ocean. We find it in you know the poisonous clouds of Venus. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that that is true, and I think I mean, but really at the end of the day, I think we've 
put such a focus on Mars because it, it's relatively close by to us. And, you know, we could potentially send people there as well to, to study the planets. You know, it, it, it's not going to be anytime soon. It's going to be definitely in the future. But, you know, people can definitely, we can send them there and, uh, you know, they would be able to study that planet directly and to search for evidence of, of life directly. Um, so, I mean, I think it's just a little bit... Uh, you know, it's a kind of a nicer environment, perhaps, for, for us to study. It's, it's more, e it's easier for us to study. Um, whereas, you know, if you send a person to Venus to, to start trying to, you know, study the surface or the cloud environment, I mean, it's just so hostile to us and, you know, it would be nearly impossible, um, you know, especially with our current technology to do something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it kind of brings you back to those um, early Russian attempts to to land. You know, to, to fly balloons around Venus and to land, you know, put landers on Venus, and quite a lot of them failed, didn't they? Because they, they just they just couldn't survive the the pressure and the and the temperature. Absolutely. So many of them failed. Um, but I mean, the ones that did, did succeed, you know, that reached the surface of the planet and took photographs are just amazing. Um, anytime I see them, it's just, you know, I find that an incredibly amazing feat. Um, of course, they, they didn't last very long, but, you know, they still lasted long enough that, you know, we kind of have an idea of what the surface of this planet looks like. And, um, you know, I imagine as well in the 1960s when, you know, when we first started sending spacecraft out to Venus, you know, the first interplanetary spacecraft was sent to the planet Venus. So that was Mariner 2. And, um, you know, the, the hope people must have felt, you know, they're sending the spacecraft out to Earth's twin or Earth's sister planet, uh, which is what Venus used to be known as. Um, and then kind of the, the, I don't know that I don't know if it would be disappointment or shock, you know, of finding this kind of hellish planet um, that is nothing like the Earth. You know, I, I think that that must have been a really exciting uh, time uh, for for space travel, especially. Definitely, it was really interesting what you were saying earlier on about um, you sort of you're sort of finding um, biosignatures, and, and that's what that's what the phosphine is. I mean, it, it, does does this kind of confirmation of the detection of a biosignature in Venus, does it, does it say anything for kind of similar detections around exoplanets, planets that beyond our solar system? Do, do, does this, like, how do you, how do you sort of feel? Are you optimistic about, about um, astronomers on Earth being, being able to detect biosignatures around planets around other stars? So I think this study will lead to people trying to find phosphine uh, coming from exoplanets and in exoplanet atmospheres. But I think we have to be a little bit careful there uh, because we do find phosphine in other places in our solar system. So it, we don't just find it on the Earth and now Venus. We also find it in some gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And in the cases of gas giant planets, phosphine is not produced by life. It, it can be produced through chemistry. And it's because uh, phosphine can be produced kind of in the depths of those planets, uh, in very high temperatures and very high pressures. And then it will kind of float up to uh, higher in the atmosphere of those planets, and then we can see it with telescopes. Um, so depending on the kind of exoplanet you're looking at, phosphine could be a biomarker. But first, we need to figure out the type of exoplanet that we're seeing, um, and then we can potentially use phosphine as a biomarker. But I do think it's a very promising biomarker that we can use to potentially search for life in, in other places. Are, are there any other sort of um, biomarkers that you might get excited about discovering around planets in the solar system or indeed exoplanets? There are some other molecules that we can use to search for life or other biomarkers. Um, and so we can, for example, use complex organic molecules um, to, to also look for uh, the evidence of life. Um, and complex organic molecules, uh, these are going to be kind of long chains of molecules that are made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, however, a lot of complex organic molecules can be produced in other ways. So at this point in time, I think phosphine is probably our best bet and the most straightforward biomarker that we have. Um, but we can use kind of these other complex organic molecules um, to also search for life. So these are things like um, methane, ethane, ethanol, methanol, uh, formaldehyde, things along those lines. What about this um, this uh, study? Are, are there any? Are you going to be making any other follow up, follow up observations, or is there any anything left to do in in, in terms of this this particular project? 
Absolutely. So um, there's a few different things we can do. Um, so first of all, we've been able to confirm phosphine with two independent telescopes, but that doesn't mean we should stop at that point. Um, so we can uh, confirm phosphine using uh, other kinds of light or in other kinds of light. So, um, you know, looking at different wavelengths of light is what I mean. So, for example, in infrared lights, you can also see phosphine. And so I think it would be a really great thing to do is to use other telescopes that can see infrared light and also confirm our phosphine observation. And then I think what we really need to do is uh, a longer term monitoring program to see how phosphine changes over time. And so to see if the amount of phosphine gas in Venus, Venus's atmosphere changes. And so we're already making the steps to, to do that. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, just in the long term, what we really need to do is get a spacecraft or a probe sent out to Venus to, to really study the atmosphere directly and, and really probe the conditions of of uh, of life in the clouds. Fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're excited about the prospect of that happening, and uh, as I am, and indeed probably most people who are listening to this are. Um, but yeah, Emily, I just wanted to say thanks very much for speaking to me and congratulations on the discovery. It's amazing. It was, it was great to see it. Um, it was great to see it kind of explode on Twitter and on, on the internet this week. Yeah, it's it's been an absolutely crazy week, but I'm I'm really glad that everyone's excited about uh, our observations. You know, the study has been going on for four years at this point, and um, so yeah, it, it's great that we can finally talk about it as well. Um, you know, because we were sworn to secrecy for so many years, and it, yeah, it's amazing that everyone is is as enthusiastic as what we've been over that time. Um, so yeah, I, you know, and I really look forward to. Um, the wider scientific community getting involved and, um, you know, kind of making uh, Venus as, as a focus for, for study. 